You want to mute mute him and everybody until it starts. Looks great. You're muted, Dr. Gantes, just to let you know. People are getting logged on right now, so we're just waiting for participants to join us. We're up to 36 right now. I'm climbing. Good afternoon, everyone. We will be getting started in a few minutes, just a couple more minutes so that we can continue to allow participants to log in. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Hey, Dr. Kilpatrick. I um I I I, used, I, I worked in Al Al Zoller's lab in Dr. Zoller's lab. Oh, got it! Great, fantastic. Yeah, I went to UC Santa Cruz for undergrad too, and so I was I was in his lab for a year, and we were we were studying um, mRNA splicing in in C. elegans. Fantastic. So it's kind of related to the vaccine, yeah. So we would like mutate you know little spots and then and put it into a plasmid and um see what kind of protein it would make yeah it's been a while it's been a while but yeah it was like 2003 when i was there for undergrad that's really cool small world yeah so we're gonna go ahead and get started we looks like we have a substantial amount of participants uh once again good afternoon everyone thank you so much for making time um maybe for some of you your lunch hour uh, to join us uh, for this very informative, what we hope will be an informative and productive dialogue. Um, my name is Erica Padilla Chavez and I'm the CEO of Mahalali Prevention and Student Assistance. And I'll let my colleague Laura introduce herself. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Laura Segura. I'm co-executive director at Monarch Services of Santa Cruz County. Welcome and happy to have you all. We'll have a uh, in a few minutes, we'll introduce our, our guest presenters, uh, but just wanted to inform um, all of you that we're hosting this event today to create a space for a community conversation and understanding the vaccines and the vaccine rollout in Santa Cruz County. And we know that within our county, we've seen issues of inequity regarding the allocation and the distribution of the vaccine as well as some of the communication centering around the vaccine itself. There's some misinformation, there's some myths, um, et cetera. So uh, today we have Dr. Oscar Gantes, who's the physician at Salud para la Gente, and also Dr. Marm Kilpatrick, who's a scientist, researcher of infectious diseases at here in, at UCSC. So we're really lucky to have them both locally. And so they're here to dispel some of those myths that I just mentioned surrounding the vaccine and also to provide a clinical overview of both vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna. Um, and after the presentation, we'll discuss um, equity some more. Just to make a comment that this event um, is being hosted by the Pajaro Valley Save Lives Group. Uh, since March, um, nonprofit leaders and city leaders and school district leaders have come together to find ways to coordinate and triage and support our community and um, individuals in living in the Pajaro Valley. And this event is being um, hosted uh, by our group, uh, our very mighty group. Uh, we will have some opportunity this afternoon um, before we end for you to ask your question, a brief question. Uh, let me just give you a couple of housekeeping items. If you have a question, you can ask it through the Q&A function that you see at the bottom of your screen. You can easily type in your question and uh, one of us, either Laura or myself, will be monitoring those questions and um, either asking uh, Dr. Kilpatrick or Dr. Antis to, to answer it. So um, when we get to that point, we will certainly let you know to start um, typing in the, your Q&A. Or if you have a question that comes up as you're hearing the conversation, feel free to type it in. 
And additionally, it's being recorded so that if some of your colleagues weren't able to be part of it today, um, you can definitely, we'll send out the information, the link so that you can forward on to your colleagues or coworkers um, as well. So we hope that this, uh, you find this information and conversation informative and we ask you to please contact us if you have questions following the presentation this afternoon. And with that, I'd like to introduce our first guest, Dr. Oscar Gantes, who I said is a physician at Salud para la Gente. Thank you for joining us, doctor. Hi, thank you for inviting me. Um, glad people can join us in this important talk. So um, we're, we're rolling out the, the, the COVID vaccines now, which is, it's gonna be, this is, this is gonna be the key to ending the, the pandemic that we have going on right now. And so we just wanna emphasize the importance of this vaccine for, for everybody. It's free for everybody, it's paid by our tax dollars. There's no, no charge for it, just so everybody knows. Um, and, and, and me and Dr. Kilpatrick are gonna give you guys some more information on it today. And, and, and I'm, a, I'm a local physician at Salud la Gente in Watsonville. Um, I'm locally from the area also. I was born in Salinas, raised in Gonzales. Um, so I'm a, I'm a local, local product from here. Okay, Lisa, if you could start the PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so this, um, this is, so this is just some general information on the vaccine, just to um, give you some basic info on it and see if we can generate any questions and uh, any concerns. Uh, so next slide, please. So like I mentioned, the COVID-19 vaccines are gonna be an essential tool to help stop this pandemic that we have going on currently. Uh, medical experts, we, we're all endorsing this vaccine. Um, it, it's safe and effective. Um, the access will be fair to be provided, at, like I mentioned, at no cost. It's going to be widely available to more and more people as the weeks go on through this year, um, based on, on who's at a higher risk. Um, it's, it's going to be essential to ending the pandemic and, and help to just get our lives back to the way they used to be. Um, next slide. And so how, so how, is this, how is this vaccine different from past vaccines? So this is a, a new a new type of vaccine, and, and Dr. Kilpatrick can get into more of the the details of it. Um, but it, it typically a vaccine has a, vi a a dead virus in it or a modified form of a virus in it, um, and this doesn't. This this vaccine is using a uh, it it's been it's been mentioned in the news that it's a new technology called mRNA, but it's not it's not a new technology. Um, mRNA has been studied for at least 30 years now, and it's, it's been studied by researchers, scientists, and all the major universities. Um, I went to UC Santa Cruz for undergrad, and when I was a college student, I was just, um, we were just talking about that right now, I was studying um, mRNA in 2003 in, in one of the labs at UC Santa Cruz when I was a college student. But so what mRNA does is it, it's gonna, it, it'll teach our, our body how to fight the virus. So it, it show, it, instead of putting the virus into the body, it teaches our body how to make a piece of the virus so that when the virus enters our body, it knows how to fight it. And it recognizes, it, it essentially recognizes it as a foreign, a foreign body. So like I mentioned, it's not a live vaccine. It doesn't go into your DNA. It doesn't change your DNA. Um, it's mRNA for the spike protein of the coronavirus. So the coronavirus, pretty much everybody's probably seen the picture of the coronavirus. Now it's, it's a, it looks like a ball and it has a bunch of spikes. It's covered in spikes. Similar to, I guess if, if you think like if you've gone out to hiking or gone out in the, in the fields and you get these little balls of spikes stuck in your socks, that's kind of like what the coronavirus is like, but instead of getting stuck in your socks, it gets stuck into our mucous membranes and then enters our body. So, so, what, so what we developed is this mRNA to make that little spike. And, and so it, it makes just the spike, which the spike is not, it's, it's not gonna cause any illness. 
it's just a piece of, of, of the virus. So, so that's injected into our arm. And then the vaccine triggers the production of the spike protein. And then our body makes antibodies to the spike protein so that when or or if we hopefully we're not we're using masks right we're, we're not if we're exposed to this virus our body knows okay i know what this is this is a bad thing and i have all the all the, the artillery artillery to fight it now and that's what the antibodies are so next slide and so how does the covid19 mrna vaccine work so it's an mRNA vaccine. It carries genetic material that teaches our cells how to make a harmless piece, piece of spike protein, which is just a little spike, um, which is found on the surface of the, of the virus. Um, once it does that, the mRNA is destroyed. Our, our body just destroys it. It, it. it does its natural thing and cleans up the, the area around it. Um, the cells display, like I mentioned, this piece of spike protein on the surface and an immune response is triggered inside of our body. So if, it, if we do get in contact with the virus, our body knows how to fight it now and it recognizes it as a foreign body. This produces antibodies to protect us from getting infected if the SARS-CoV-2 virus enters our body. So MR, mRNA vaccines do not affect our DNA. Uh, mRNA does not enter the cell nucleus, so it's not going to change your DNA in any way. Um, mRNA vaccines cannot give you COVID-19 because it's not the real virus. It's just, it's just making the little spike, just a little piece of it, just so that when your body sees it, it's like, hey, I know what that is. We're going we're gonna to kill that, and we're not going to let it infect us. Um, mRNA vaccines are new, but the technology is not new. Like I mentioned, the technology, mRNA technology, is not, it's been researched for at least 30 years. People's grandmothers have researched mRNA by now. This is, it's, not, it's not new technology. Um, mRNA vaccines have been studied for influenza, Zika, rabies, and, and cytomegaloviruses, for example. How well do they work? Pfizer, 95%, Moderna, 94.5%, which that's, that's wonderful. Um, they both need two doses. Um, so it's a booster, the second's a booster dose. Um, and you gotta get the same one. So if you get Pfizer, you stick with Pfizer, you get Moderna, you get Moderna. Um, and, and they work super good to prevent you from getting super sick from this, from this um, virus. Uh, are they safe? What do we know? It's been the, the Pfizer, they're reporting they've studied in 44,000 people, Moderna 30,000, um, which is more than some other vaccines that have been on the market. It's gone through all the phases like any other vaccine would. It's in phase three currently. So it's not jumping over any phases, it's not jumping over any, any steps that it needs to go through to make sure that it's a safe vaccine. Next slide. And, um, and, then, and then the vaccine trials by the numbers. So just, this is just showing that it, it's, been, um, it's been studied in different ethnic groups um, through, throughout the country. So the Pfizer, it's been it's 150 clinical sites, 39 states. It's been studied in Latinos, Black people, Asian people, Native Americans, a wide range of ages, particularly the older ages that are more susceptible to getting sick. Same thing with Moderna, uh, different ethnicities, different age groups. So just to show that it's been it's been tried in, in, in all these different ethnicities and age groups. Because so typically in the past, in medicine, medicines have typically tended to be only studied in white male men in their 40s. So that's something that we're trying to get away from. And this is a great study. They, they, they've really tested it out on, on you know, our, our diverse population that we have in our country. Next slide. So is it okay for everyone to get it? So it can be given to people 16 and older, the Pfizer, Moderna, 18 and older. If you've had a bad reaction to a vaccine in the past, and you just talk to your doctor and find out if, if you might get a reaction from this vaccine. Next slide. Uh, what if I had an allergic reaction to an mRNA vaccine? You probably you probably haven't because this is, this is the first mRNA vaccine. So so that's but if you if you have somehow you have had an, an allergic reaction to mRNA vaccine, then, then no. Um, if you're allergic to polysorbate or Miralax, so Miralax is something that you take when you're constipated. It's, the, it's like a powder, you take, you take it once a day for constipation. 
polysorbate is, is, is just, it's another, it's another kind of fat molecule that, and both of these, pro, both of these um, um, ingredients are found in different foods and, and cosmetics. So if you had any allergies to any particular foods or cosmetics and talk to your doctor about it and make sure that it's not gonna, it's not gonna be um, the same um, type of uh, fat that's in the, in the vaccine. Uh, what if I've had allergic to reactions of the other vaccines? Yeah, you might wanna sit this one out, but again, talk to your doctor about it. I mean, it, it, you can always just stay it longer. You can come in and get the vaccine. And normally we have people wait 15 minutes. You can wait 30 minutes and we can just keep an eye on you a little bit longer because the benefit of this vaccine is, is, is what outweigh the risk. Uh, what if I'm pregnant? Yes, you can get it. Um, if, you're, if you're pregnant at all, you don't have any other problems, you should discuss it with your doctor. If you're breastfeeding, yes, you can get it. If you're immunocompromised, yes. If you have the autoimmune disease, yes. Especially in those conditions, you want the extra protection from this vaccine. Um, can I get the vaccine? Uh, what if I had COVID-19? Yes, you can You can get the, the vaccine as long as you're not you know, actively sick with, uh, with COVID. If you've, uh, if you've had COVID-19 and, and you've um, gotten better, then you can get the vaccine. What if I was exposed to COVID-19? If you're still in quarantine, don't come out of quarantine to get your vaccine because then you're gonna expose all of us. So. Once you're done with your quarantine, head over and get your vaccine if you're next on the list. Um, so there's things on the internet that are going around on Facebook and YouTube. So let's see what these some of these things are. So I already had COVID-19, so I don't need to get the vaccine. So the truth is we don't know if or how long you've been, you, you're protected after you've had it. So typically you're protected for three months after you've had the, the, the infection. Uh, Moderna is saying that the, the vaccine, their vaccine will protect you for up to a year. Um, so you get that extra protection. Next slide. More people will die from COVID-19 vaccine than would actually die from the virus. So it's important to know that the vaccine is far safer than the disease as virus is 10 times deadlier than the flu. So it's the actual opposite. Um, this vaccine is gonna save lots and lots of lives. Just like any other vaccine, I mean, if you think of all the other vaccines we've had, when you go in as a child or you take your kids in for their shots, all of these vaccines that we've gotten as kids um, and, and as adults, they've, they've changed, they, they've changed um, our, our longevity of life and, and, and different diseases that we don't, we don't even see anymore, we don't get anymore because vaccines have, have revolutionized medicine and, and our well-being. Um, so myth, the COVID-19 vaccine was made to control through microchips. So there's no vaccine microchip and the vaccine will not track people or gather, gather your personal information. So there's no chip in, in the vaccine, it's just, it's just mRNA, they're not implanting a chip in you. So that's not, that's not true. Next slide. And it'll change, COVID-19 vaccine will change my DNA. So putting mRNA vaccine into your body will not change the DNA. It doesn't enter your DNA, doesn't enter the nucleus um, of your cells. So it's not gonna have any effect on your DNA. Uh, your body will br uh, break it down and clean it up after it's used it to make the spike protein and, and, and ready your immune, your immune system to fight this virus. Uh, next slide. COVID-19 vaccines were made with fetal tissue. Um, so no, neither vaccine has fetal cells in it. Fetal cells were not used to make either uh, vaccine. So no, that's not true. We did not, we did not use pieces of, of babies to make this vaccine. And um, COVID vaccines will not give you COVID-19 because it's, and that's the advantage is that, is, and that's the cool thing of this vaccine is that typically in the past vaccines have been um, dead viruses, um, they've been viruses that have been changed a little bit, which could put you at risk um, if, if, it, if, it, if, it isn't, if it isn't done correctly or could put the people at risk that are making the vaccines because they're having to handle viruses themselves. But the, that's the awesome thing about this vaccine is that there, it has nothing, there's no virus in it, there's no modified virus, there's no dead virus. It's just a strand of mRNA that's going to make the spike so that your body recognizes it. So there's no way this can give you COVID-19. Why should I get the vaccine if it might make me feel bad? 
So the side effect, like I've got my vaccine, I got the Moderna, I got a sore arm. That was pretty much it. Um, you can get some symptoms of maybe like a headache, body aches, um, maybe stuffy nose, uh, but they don't last long. And that's actually a good sign. So if you're, feel, if we're, if you're getting a sore arm or any other little symptoms like that, that means that, that your body, the immune system, it, you woke it up and it's gonna make antibodies to fight this, this virus now. So the vaccine works very well to prevent you from getting ill from COVID-19. COVID-19 can lead to death or long-term problems. Yes, yeah, so I'm sure many of you have heard people now they're weeks out, months out. They haven't regained their sense of taste, smell. They still, they feel really tired. So there's still some long-term problems you can have even if you don't um, succumb to the, to the infection. The vaccine protects you and your community. That's the most important thing is it's gonna, not only is it protecting you, but it's also protecting your family members, your neighbors, people in the grocery store in your community, you're, you're, done, you're not just doing this for yourself, you're doing it for everyone around you also. Uh, what about after I get the vaccine? Well, uh, we will all, so you still need to wear your mask in public because if you do get infected, um, it, it does take a little bit of, you know, couple, it takes some time for your body to make all the antibodies to fight this, this virus. So if you do get infected, you won't, you, you most likely, you won't get very sick and, and you most likely won't, maybe not even feel anything at all, but you still may be able to transmit it. So you still need to wear your mask in public. Um, if you have been around someone with COVID-19, you, you still need to quarantine, yes. It will take time for this to change. We need to know more about the virus and all of that. So yeah, so the more we, the more we learn about the, uh, how effective the vaccine is over time, then, then we'll be able to make more uh, recommendations and hopefully, um, um, make some of the recommendations a little less strict. Uh, COVID-19 vac COVID vaccine is here. Stay informed, keep wearing your mask. Uh, all the national top medical experts, um, are, we all say it's safe and effective. It's at no cost. It's, um, it's, gonna, be, it's gonna be rolled out based on your risk level and level of exposure and, and widely available later this year. Next slide. And this is some of the, our staff getting vaccinated. So to the far right, that's Dr. Corey. She's getting her shots. One of our nurses in the middle, another staff member on the side, and then everybody on the side happy with their card that they got their vaccine. And so, okay, so I made it sound good, right? Convinced everybody you need to get your shot. So it's like, okay, well, where do I go get it? So you got to know when it's your turn. So if you go to this website, if you just type in my turn for the vaccine, if you don't want to type all this out, HTTPS, my turn, or my turn.ca.gov, it'll come out if you just Google my turn for the vaccine. That's the top hit, my turn. And then you put in your, your, your phone number and you'll get a text um, when you're next in line to get the vaccine and where you can go um, register for it. Thank you so much. That was super informative. And um, I know for me, I hadn't even thought of some of these questions or that you uh, pointed out, including people that are pregnant, you know, compromised, whether, you know, the age group and changing the DNA. So that was really helpful information. Um, thank you for that. And we'll have the opportunity to ask some questions after this. So next up, we want to introduce Marm Kilpatrick at, from UCSC, who is a scientist and will share some science behind the vaccines. Thank you for joining us. And for those of you who have asked questions about the variants, see, the, Dr. Kilpatrick will be speaking um, to those questions. So I see some questions already posted on this topic. Super, thank you guys so much. Um, and so I'm gonna to try to address three questions that I think Erica thought would be really helpful for people to know. And so those three questions are, how effective are these two vaccines that are now um, available for people to get well, when it's your turn um, against these new viral strains that people have probably heard about in the news? The second question is, is what is this concept of herd immunity? What does it really mean? And how and when will we get there? And the third question, which is related to what um, Dr. Hunt, uh, Oscar just said a minute ago um, is uh, after we get vaccinated, can we stop wearing masks? And I wanna give you a tiny bit of the kind of detailed data behind the answer to that question. So that's the first part. Um, okay, so the first question is, is 
are these vaccines effective against these new viral variants? And let me be, just be super clear that these new variants that you probably heard about in the news, they're basically the same coronavirus, but just with a little bit of its RNA change. So there's the same virus, but just a slight, a few mutations basically. And so scientists are calling those variants. Okay, so there are three variants that are showing up in the news and being talked about a lot. Um, the scientists are trying to give these uh, variants names, but we're trying to be a little bit careful and not name them after places. Uh, for two reasons. One is, is it's not necessarily the case that, uh, that that place is, we don't want to blame those places for the, the variants arising in those places. And in fact, it turns out that those are just the first places that these variants were detected. They may actually have arisen somewhere else. In fact, we now know that the South Africa variant was actually detected even earlier in a different country than in South Africa. So I, so I want to try to make that clear, but just to try to connect it for people that have heard things in the news, people have referred to some of these variants as the UK variant, from England or the United Kingdom, the South Africa variant or the Brazil variant. And here's the, these are the names here that people or the scientists are using for them. So um, just to bring us up to speed on, I think the things you may have heard about in the news about this, just so you know why we think, why we care at all about these variants in the first place. The first is that um, the variant that was first detected in the UK, this B117, there's pretty good evidence now that it's more transmissible and probably about 50% more transmissible um, than the variant, than the virus that we, the original virus that first uh, spread throughout our, our globe. Um, there's some evidence it's not quite as strong, that maybe it's a little bit more deadly. That's not super, there's a little bit of evidence for that, but it's not as uh, well established as the transmissibility part. But those are the two reasons that we were worried about this variant. And as people probably know, this variant has now been detected in most states in the US. So it's in California, it's definitely in many states, um, but it's at low frequency right now and kind of rising up because it's more transmissible than the other virus. So this virus variant will probably become the dominant strain in the next month or two. The other variant that um, people are, uh, the other two that people are concerned about are these uh, variants first detected in South Africa and another one in, in Brazil. Um, and these are, have spread uh, quite rapidly in these two countries, um, but we don't know exactly why yet. The data on that is not as clear as it is for the variant detected in the UK. It's either because they're actually more transmissible, just like the variant detected in the UK, or it's um, possibly because they can infect people that have been previously infected because it can escape their immune system or their immunity. Um, and they actually, we actually have evidence for this latter part. We don't have evidence for the transmissibility part, but it's possible it's a combination of the two. Okay, so the big, the first thing I want to try to address is, is do these vaccines that you guys hopefully will have access to either already now or very soon when it becomes your turn, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, um, how well do they work against these variants? Uh, I will tell you that the, we don't have direct evidence. There's not been a clinical trial with these two uh, vaccines against these viral variants, but we actually have quite a bit, bit of information from indirect studies. And I'm gonna show you what that is now to try to really give you the kind of basis for our understanding. So the efficacy for these vaccines against these variants is based on the antibodies um, that uh, Dr. Gante just talked about a minute ago and how well they actually can neutralize or kind of inactivate the virus. Um, but let me be clear that the, the neutralization of this virus by our antibodies is only one part of our immune system. And we also make B and T cells as a part of our immune reaction. And those also are, are uh, very important and quite effective also at fighting off the virus. Um, so, so the summary of the next couple slides that I'm gonna show you is that um, vaccination is likely um, just as good against the old virus as well as against the UK variant of the virus, this B117. So that's great news. This virus that we know is um, already in the US and already spreading that we think is more infectious um, the vac both of these vaccines are just as good against that variant. It doesn't appear to actually have any changes that make it able to escape our immunity to that, um, to that variant. So that's great. Um, we have some data uh, actually from another vaccine trial by a company called Novavax that actually shows pretty convincingly that getting their vaccine at least, and there's reason to suspect that probably also the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, that that kind of vaccination, the vaccination period, is more effective actually than normal infection. And I think I'll show that in one of my slides later. So, so there's two, as I see it, there's several good reasons to get these vaccines when it's your turn. The first is that they're definitely effective. Um, they're likely like just as good against the UK variant. And, um, and even if you've been previously exposed or even if you haven't, the vaccination derived immunity appears to be more effective than actually natural infection. So that's kind of uh, two, two good news uh, points there. Okay, so let me just show you the actual uh, indirect data that suggests that the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccines are actually um, just equally good against the UK variant. Um, but I will also show data that suggests that they're actually not as effective against this South Africa or B1351 variant. And I'll tell you that we don't have great data for the P1 variant yet, but the mutations that it has are similar to the ones in the South Africa variant. And so, um, so most scientists think that the effects will probably be similar to those, maybe not identical. 
Okay, so the first um, uh, data slide here is just that the Pfizer vaccine, when we take people who have been vaccinated with that vaccine and we test their antibodies, so the little kind of proteins in our, uh, in our blood that we make in response to exposure either to the virus or the vaccination um, against viruses that, that have these mutations, the two graphs that I'm showing here, the upper graph is basically comparing what they call the Wuhan reference strain of the virus or the B117, which is the UK variant, and the y-axis on both graphs is the virus neutralization titer. And you can think of it as how kind of effective a given concentration is of our blood at fighting the virus. And so higher is better. And so what you can hopefully see with your naked eye in the top graph is that whether the antibodies are acting against the original virus, which is the Wuhan reference, or this variant first detected in the UK, they're basically equally good. A few of them go down a tiny bit, a few go up a tiny bit, there's basically kind of no real differences between that. So that says that the Pfizer vaccine is gonna work just as well uh, in terms of our antibodies um, against this UK variant or B1, B117 as the original virus. So that's fantastic news. Um, the lower graph is a little bit more concerning and that just shows that the variant first section in South Africa, our antibodies are a little bit less effective um, against that uh, than, than against the original strain, but there's still um, some, uh, uh, we actually, our antibodies still neutralize that virus um, pretty well. So it's a little bit lower, but still uh, pretty good. So that's the, um, the Pfizer vaccine. The Moderna vaccine, um, uh, the same kind of question. So the upper graph here is basically again comparing in this graph, they show the, um, the original virus that they're calling it G. And then the UK variant is over here is the B117. And again, your eye can hopefully see that there's basically um, no real difference in, um, in how well our antibodies neutralize the virus. So that's great news um, against that strain. And then the South Africa variant, again, which um, we have evidence that it might have some immune escape going on. There is actually some evidence for that in that the antibody titers, kind of how good our um, antibodies actually neutralize this virus is definitely lower for the South Africa variant, this B1351, than it is for the kind of original type that we found the first kind of original virus. However, let me point out a really important thing. Although it is lower, and you can kind of see it's lower, it's actually about sixfold lower. You may have seen news reports about this because people all jumped up and down about this in the news, but it looks like what's super clear is that actually all these people that were in this study, their sera or their antibodies all still neutralize the virus, just a little bit lower concentration. So hopefully that part is clear. The important part here is that it still actually provides us a huge benefit, just not quite as strong as it was against the original strain. So that's, um, that's very great and important. Um, so that's the Moderna vaccine. So that's both Pfizer and Moderna. Great against the UK variant that you've heard so much about that's spreading in the US and it's actually already here in California. Um, not quite as good as against South Africa, but still um, quite effective. So that's gonna be good for us as well. Um, and then the last part that I wanna show just as a one more reason, I think to motivate all of us to get vaccinated when, when it's our turn is that um, we actually have quite good data from a few different places now that the vaccines are actually giving us better immunity than exposure to the virus itself. And that's, uh, scientists think that's probably because of the way that the vaccines are made that they really get our body to mount a strong immune response to the spike protein that Dr. Gante's talked about. Um, and so what I'm showing you here is, um, is data from South Africa during a vaccine trial for this other vaccine by the company Novavax. And, um, and additionally, some data from just a study where they just looked at people who had previous exposure to the virus um, in South Africa. And then they looked at how well their antibodies actually, again, neutralized the virus that was the original virus or this new kind of variant that arose in South Africa in the last couple months. And unfortunately, um, as the previous slides would suggest, the, um, this new virus variant from South Africa was actually able to evade that the neutralization from antibodies of people that have been previously exposed to the virus. So this is not due to vaccination, this is due to previous exposure. And it suggested that in fact, about half of people, their antibodies couldn't neutralize the virus anymore. So that suggests that this virus does, has evolved a little bit to escape our immune system, but quite positively, um, in that Novavax trial, their vaccine was actually still pretty effective at neutralizing, at, at actually protecting people from getting sick from this virus. So this is further evidence that suggests that even though the virus is mutating and trying to infect us better and infect some people that have been previously exposed, the vaccines that we've made actually give us slightly even more improved immunity than the, the natural exposure itself. So that's um, the kind of take home from this. And I think that's actually quite positive and, and, and very encouraging. Okay, so the summary of these slides is that both the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine will provide substantial protection against the new variants and actually especially against severe disease. Um, so there's, uh, Dr. Ante has talked about a little bit, but the trials were actually run to both protect against mild, any kind of disease. So just even mild symptoms or as, and also to protect us against severe disease and they're good actually against both. Um, and so that's fantastic. Um, and I wanna emphasize here, 
we actually now have evidence that these vaccines protect us even better than previous exposure against some of these new variants. And that's uh, quite important. So because of that, um, I actually am quite excited to get vaccinated with either vaccine, whichever one they offer me, Pfizer or Moderna, as soon as it's my turn. Um, and that will be great because it'll protect me against illness, but also the people around me. And that's my next slide. So the question is, how does it protect the people around me? So that's this idea of herd immunity. And you may have heard of that. And you may have also heard of something called the herd immunity threshold. So I wanna just try to explain how that works. The idea here is that if you're in a population where everyone is susceptible, meaning no one's been infected or no one's been um, vaccinated, that if you take an infected person and they come into that community, which is what happened to us back in March last year, then they can start spreading it. So the graph on the right-hand side, the top graph, the little people in red are infected and the people in blue have never been exposed or vaccinated. And what happens of course, is when they interact with people around them, they can infect people around them. And so um, when scientists have measured how fast the virus is spreading from person to person back in March, when we had no masks or social distancing, each person was infecting on average about two to three other people every five to seven days and then uh, recovering and, and kind of being done with that infection. So that was the kind of spreading rate that the virus had before, which is why the virus spread really rapidly through our communities. Because of course, if it's infecting, if it's doubling or tripling the number of cases every five to seven days, obviously you can get out of hand pretty quickly. So that's the case under when the virus first invades. As the population becomes more and more immune, either by becoming infected and recovering, which has happened unfortunately to quite a few members of our community, probably about 50 to 70,000 people now in Santa Cruz County, um, but now we have this vaccine, so we actually can provide not just that same immunity, but actually probably slightly better immunity by vaccinating people. As we do that, we get more and more people that are actually immune. And when we do that, we move through from this top graph to a little bit of this middle graph, all the way down to this bottom graph, where if we can get a lot of the community both uh, with immune due to vaccination, then when you have infected people that are in the community, which are still these little people in red, most of the people around them will actually already be immune. That's the people in yellow. And so there's actually kind of a magical threshold, which is called the herd immunity threshold, which is when the population gets to be uh, reach this level. Um, and for this disease, for the original strain, it was probably between uh, 50 and 65%. Once we'd gotten to that level, then each person which used to infect, say two people or three people, if we could get up to that level, then each person would infect only on average one other person. And that means the number of cases would neither grow nor fall. So if we could get the herd immunity, get the fraction of people immune by vaccination above that level, then each person would infect less than one other person on average and the number of cases would fall. So that's fantastic. So that's the idea is that if we can basically get enough people vaccinated, then each person that's infected, they may still go on to infect one or two other people, but on average, each person will infect less than one other person and the cases will fall and the virus will reduce in our community. And that's exactly what we're aiming for, of course. Okay, so as I said briefly before, this new variant um, that people detect in the UK, but that is now in all over the US, including California, looks like it has a slightly higher infectiousness than the original virus. And that we actually have a symbol for that. It's this little symbol called R0, you may have seen in the press, or RT or R effective or other words we sometimes use for that. Um, and it turns out that if that number is higher, which we think it is for this new variant, that means we have to vaccinate a slightly higher fraction of the population. So now our new target is probably something on the order of uh, 60 to 80%, and so if we can get above that, then we'll get the virus to basically start declining in our community. And that's what we want. And so the last um, uh, question I wanted to try to answer um, is after we get vaccinated, should we have to keep wearing a mask and do we have to still keep social distancing? And uh, Dr. Hunt uh, Gantes already uh, gave you one answer and I wanna give you the same answer, but I also wanna give you a tiny bit more information behind it and give you a little bit of a window for when we can stop doing some of these things. Because I think part of the social distancing that I think is hard for some of us is we want to see our friends and family um, and do some of the social things we used to want to do. So unfortunately, if I get vaccinated today and all the people around me aren't vaccinated, then I should still wear a mask and still uh, give people space and not try not, both try not to get infected myself and try not to infect anyone else. And that's for these couple of reasons here. So the first is that these vaccines seem, they, they look fantastic right now. Their efficacy is really, really high, about 95%, which Dr. Gante showed before. That's fantastic. We don't know yet how long they last. We know they last for at least two to three months. That's what the trials showed us. It could be six months, it could be two years, it could be 10 years, it could be 20 years. We don't have that data yet. So we wanna make sure it's gonna last for a while before we say get vaccinated and then two months later start having parties and maybe the immunity isn't as strong as we thought. So, um, so we're gonna get more data on that just in the next couple months and we'll probably have updates on that soon, which is great. The second most important thing is that if you're vaccinated but your friends and family are not, then as I'm gonna show you uh, lower on the slide, there's a chance that you actually might be able to get infected, not know it and pass the virus on. And so you wouldn't obviously wanna infect your friends and family around you if they're not vaccinated yet. So you need to get vaccinated, your friends and family need to get vaccinated. And then finally, because the vaccine is gonna reduce transmission, which I'm gonna explain in a second, 
that will bring down the virus in our community. And so when we have the virus at lower levels and most people are vaccinated, then we get to let go of the masks, start let go of the social distancing, start seeing our friends and family and start having the wonderful interactions that we wanna have. So the, the details on that last part is that, um, as Dr. Gante said, both of these vaccines reduce your chances of symptomatic infection by 95%, which is fantastic, but that's not 100%. So there is still a small chance that you will get, um, get sick from getting infected. So that's why it's good to uh, avoid infection until we get the virus level down in our community to lower levels. That's important. Um, the Moderna vaccine also greatly reduces your chances of severe illness, which is fantastic. In fact, in that trial, um, there were actually 30 cases of severe illness in the people that didn't get the vaccine and zero um, in the vaccination group. So actually that, that uh, control word should say vaccination actually. I might correct that because that's that important. All right. Um, and so uh, it turns out that we also have additional data from the Moderna trial that suggests that at least the first shot of that vaccine reduces your chance of getting infected asymptomatically. So having kind of a silent infection by at least two thirds. So that's good too, but unfortunately it's not hundred percent. So what that means is that if you get vaccinated um, and then you get exposed to the virus, if you aren't safe, you don't wear your masks or you start hanging out with friends a bunch, then it's possible for you to get infected. And there's about a 5% chance you might get mildly sick. That wouldn't be great, but wouldn't be terrible, but it would still be not ideal. But slightly worse than that is there's a chance that you could get infected and get a, a silent or asymptomatic infection that you might be able to pass on to your friends and family if they're not vaccinated yet, and then they could get very sick. So that's basically the, the science and the data behind why we have to still be a bit careful after we get vaccinated until our friends and family are also vaccinated and we get the virus down a little bit lower in our community. So that's um, all I had to say. And so I think hopefully there's a bunch of time for people to ask questions of anyone. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Kilpatrick and Dr. Gantes. We do have a few questions. So this first one, um, I'll pose it to Dr. Gantes. Um, if we can stop sharing screen, there we go. What about nursing mothers, Dr. Gantes? Can it affect um, the baby nursing? It's a question from one of our viewers. No, so the research right now doesn't it doesn't affect anything in the breast milk, so you can lactate safely and still get the vaccine. Thank you for ans uh, asking that question. Um, we have a question, and can I actually add one more point to that too? Yes, yes, go there's, ahead. There's actually some new science just out that suggests that the moms actually also pass their antibodies to their um, baby. So there's actually not only is there not a negative effect, which is what Dr. Gante says, which is correct. But in addition, there's actually a positive of that. So if the mom has antibodies um, from the exposure or vaccination, she'll actually be able to actually give some antibodies to her baby, which will slightly protect the baby, which is fantastic. And how does it affect folks who have a term who have a terminal illness like cancer? Dr. Gandhi, do you want to take that? Well, if you have a if you have a terminal illness like cancer or any other condition that's going to make your body weaker. And it's going to take, if you do get infected, it's going to take your body longer to mount an, uh, an antibody response. So if you have the vaccine, it, you're preparing your body for any kind of infection, and, and in this case, COVID. So it's getting your body ready for if you do get infected. So it's, it's, it's beneficial, it's helpful, um, and there's no contraindications for if you have cancer. Thank you. We have a question about the Johnson & Johnson um, vaccine that we're hearing about. Um, we know that uh, the question is Johnson & Johnson has a less effective vaccine coming out. Will people be able to choose? There is concern, health risk of a less impactful vaccine as we've been hearing reports that I believe it's stating in the 80th percentile, maybe I'm misquoting, but it's got less of a, of a or at least the initial reports show of a less of a percentage rate of effectiveness. Uh, who would like to take that? Dr. Kilpatrick, maybe? I can, yeah. So um, so uh, let's, let me be super careful. So it turns out that the Johnson Johnson vaccine trial had a different definition of how severe of a case they were trying to prevent. And so they actually were actually aiming to prevent um, uh, moderate and severe cases rather than any case at all. And so that slight difference in case definition actually makes the trials a little bit difficult to compare. And in addition to that, um, as people I'm sure know, Johnson & Johnson and the Novavax trial, those two, they just reported results of those just in the past week. And in fact, they've only really reported them by press release. So there actually aren't detailed data for either of those vaccines in terms of how effective they really are for each of the different kinds of illnesses. So, um, so while it's possible that, they, that Johnson & Johnson vaccine may be slightly less effective, um, we don't actually know that yet. And let me say one other big thing, that vaccine is actually, that trial was for a single dose. And so the two other um, vaccines are actually two-dose vaccines, as Dr. Gantes pointed out earlier. And most scientists believe, and actually the Johnson Johnson Company 
is actually doing a two dose trial right now, it's quite possible that if you get a second dose of that vaccine, it'll be just as good as the other vaccines. So one of the things we don't know, unfortunately, that I think Dr. Gante said briefly before, is we're actually not sure if you got a single dose of the Moderna or the Pfizer, uh, how good and how long that protection would last. The, the really good thing and the effective thing about this Johnson Johnson trial was it actually told us how good that was and how long it would last for several months. Whereas we actually don't have that data yet for the other um, vaccines. But when Johnson Johnson releases their other trial with the two doses, then we will know, okay, how good is it for to get one dose and just have one or how good is it to get two? And so, um, so I think if it was me, so A, first, the FDA has actually not given any youth authorization for Johnson Johnson yet. Um, when they do, they'll actually, we'll have all the data from that trial in our hands and probably even the data from the two dose trial, but uh, certainly all the data from the one dose trial. And so uh, personally, I will wait to see that data before I would make any sort of assessment to even care whether I care which vaccine I get. And then I think um, you could talk with your doctor and see whether the doctor thinks there's actually any real difference between the vaccines or not. And so far, the data that have been made available are not clear enough to, for us to actually assess that. Thank you for that clarification, Dr. Kilpatrick. Don't believe everything you hear in the news. There's usually more behind it. Um, there's a question about uh, symptoms, and maybe Dr. Gantis, you can answer this. The question is, why does taking a vaccine cause any symptoms at all if a vaccine just contains instructions for the body about how to fight the spikes in the future? To my understanding, the reason you get some mild symptoms with normal vaccines is because it contains a small amount of the virus. So you're getting the symptoms because your body is mounting that immune response. That, that's why you're getting, you might feel body aches. And, and um, so when I, give, when I give the kids the vaccines in the clinic, the mom, will, the mom sometimes will ask me, well, can you give me some Tylenol if they get a fever, which they might get a little mild fever. I, I tell them, no, that's, that's actually good. That means that the vaccine is working. And if they and the research has shown that the kids do get a fever, it actually shows that the vaccine works even better. So it, it's just it's it's proof that your body is doing what we want it to do. So it's mounting that immune response. It's, it's making the antibodies. Um, so it's just proof um, that it's working. It's not it's not it's not anything negative. It's something positive. That's really good to know uh, because I know that's a, always a question is what's yeah. happening to, to, to my body um, when I do get the vaccine. And a lot of our people on this call are employees and um, staffers. And so we work with a lot of folks that say that survival rate um, for COVID is high. So what's the point of getting the vaccine? And so they're looking at it from a different perspective. Um, I'll give it to you, Dr. Kilpatrick. You want that one? That question? Okay, sure. Yeah. So, so I think the the easy, quick answer to that is that uh, this virus is actually uh, moderately dangerous and actually quite dangerous if you're an older person or have some at-risk health conditions. So, in fact, for people over 75, uh, the chance of dying given infection is about 10%. So, I really would not want to get infected with a virus that if I get it, I have a 10% chance of dying. That's a really terrible, terrible outcome. Whereas um, if I get this vaccine, all the trials of tens of thousands of people suggest that you're going to get relatively mild symptoms like fatigue, maybe a little bit of pain in your arm, uh, maybe a little bit of a headache for a day or two, and then you're actually going to have protection against severe illness. So, uh, so I think it's a pretty easy one for me. Thank you. Yeah, this is this is and just to add to that, this virus is horrible. Um, normally, what we would see, the deaths we would see in this manner, where you, you get you get intubated because you're getting uh, respiratory failure from pneumonia. We would see this maybe like, see this happen without COVID, when just from normal pneumonia and the flu. We would see it happen in the winter. Right? When I was at Natividad, we'd see it happen maybe like two, three times in a, in a month where we just can't save the person because their, their lungs are fl full of fluid. And, and, and we put them on this, this machine that they're, uh, rotate them like they're like a rotisserie chicken and hope that the fluid works its way out and it, it never does, they always die. So we would see that, you know, maybe like two, three times out of the month. This, th this is happening every day now, all week long in the hospitals, all it's the whole year. Like this is, it's horrible, it's horrible. And just seeing that happen two, three times out of the month at Natividad was, was depressing and, and so, I'm in the clinic now, so I'm not in, in the hospital, but I'm, I'm sending my patients to the hospital. I'm following them and I'm seeing that they're struggling. They're not doing well. My friends that are working in the hospital, they're, 
uh, you know, they told me if you see the census go down, it's probably not because we discharged them home, it's probably because they died. So it, thank it's, you. Uh, um, so uh, we're going to take a couple more questions. What would you say to people who are concerned that there hasn't been much, much research about the long term effects of the vaccine, especially since the mRNA vaccines are fairly new? Dr. Kilpatrick? I can answer it quickly. Maybe Dr. Gonzalez maybe has additional comments. But uh, so in the other vaccine trials we've done for other kinds of vaccines, um, any sort of serious uh, side effects that we see in those trials have almost always shown up in the first two months. So even though we don't have obviously say five years of data on follow-up of the safety of the vaccine, in the other trials where we had some side effects and also some bad side effects, those all showed up quite early. And so, um, so all the scientists that have been working on vaccines for the last 50 years, um, uh, they were really, really on the edge of their seat to get the first two months worth of data. And if those looked okay, then they'd feel much, much more comfortable. So, um, so that's the reason that, uh, that scientists feel relatively comfortable in saying, if this was gonna cause something bad, we would have seen it in the first two months. And as Dr. Gantes correctly pointed out, um, the vaccine trial size for these vaccines was actually like much bigger than almost all other vaccines we've ever studied before. So the shingles vaccine, for example, which was one of the more recently um, uh, licensed vaccines, the trials were half to a third as big as the current trials. So we actually have a huge amount of safety data from this vaccine. Um, and we have several months now of safety data and it all looks very, very uh, safe. And that's very encouraging. We would have seen uh, really bad outcomes if they were going to happen. So it sounds like the due diligence that needed to happen did happen um, with both companies, uh, with both vaccines. So that's great to know. Um, thank you, Asta, for that question. Good question. And lastly, uh, Marielena, some of our young adults are concerned with vaccines and beauty fillers, Botox. Is there a reason to be concerned? Dr. Gantes, can you take that one? I don't, I don't really understand the question. What is it? What is it? It's that some, some, young, some young adults are concerned with the vaccines and beauty fillers slash Botox. Is there a reason to be concerned? For Botox? Is or there filler? any interaction between those uh, vaccines? Oh, is there any the interaction? And filler? Yeah. No, no, filler. no there, sh there shouldn't be. I mean, the, the Botox is pretty localized wherever you're going to get it. Filler, the same way. It's not systemic. It shouldn't be going systemically into your body. So there should be no, no interaction with Go get all your Botox, all your filler done, and then get your vaccine right after so you can look good while you're getting it. Well, the struggle is very real among young people and us older, more mature folks as well. <laughs> Thank you for that. Erica? Okay, yeah, so um, I just saw another question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it and see if we have time to answer it. Uh, we've come to the point of our program where Laura will provide an overview of some of the work that we've been doing in South County. We see a question in relationship to our farm worker community and when is there an anticipation to have farm workers vaccinated. I don't know that we'll have the concrete answer, but Laura will give you an overview of the work that we're doing and we're going to be soliciting your help so that we can continue to be equity minded as we're um, distributing vaccines across California. So Laura? Yes, uh, thank you, Erica. So really quickly, uh, really good questions around why uh, it, things are getting rolled out the way they're, they are getting rolled out. So I just want to give you a quick, some quick background. Um, we have a large collective of 55 nonprofits, public institutions, and individuals who are working together as the South County COVID Support and Triage Group. We've been meeting together since last March, so almost a year. And really, we're really concerned about the resource allocation, uh, whether it's the, uh, the vaccines, um, the testing, uh, so all aspects of COVID. And we really want to make sure that, that, there's, that equity is at the forefront of all the planning and all the decision making. And we also really want to elevate the voices of our essential workers in food production, the service industry, uh, all low wage workers in our county. And we're very concerned that, that the systems through which the vaccine right now is being distributed and managed may result in significant inequity. Um, especially those who had, have labored through COVID to ensure the rest of the county has fruits and vegetables on their tables, cooked and ready meals to pick up and bring home from restaurants and homes and gardens maintained. 
they don't have all the information and scheduling access that the rest of us uh, do. So this is the same group of workers that has been most affected by COVID, experiencing up to four times the rate of illness of other demographics, specifically in our county. So what we're really asking um, is that we need our elected officials and our leaders to ensure that the longstanding inequities that exist that are at the root of the disproportionate COVID impact in communities of color, specifically the Latinx community in our, in our area, really don't drive the systems of the vaccine distribution. So we're asking for an equitable implementation plan and really some targeted outreach to these communities, hard to reach community, including the indigenous speaking communities. Uh, we want that. And so um, Erica, I'll pass it back to you so you can talk a little bit more about um, how we, the, our call for action. Yes, so just uh, to all of our viewers, you'll be proud to know that we've been working in partnership with our local county um, public health um, agencies to try to continue to improve uh, as much as can be done locally. But this issue is bigger than just the county of Santa Cruz or any county for that matter. Um, this has everything to do, starts with the feds and it goes to the states and then it gets trickled down to our county. So clearly when Laura mentioned systems, we're not just talking about our local systems, we're talking about overall systems. So one of the things that we know is happening with vaccine rollout is that there, there's constant change happening in terms of who's going to be, how much do we have? Um, these vaccines that are going through the FDA regulatory process, we don't really know when um, they'll get the green light. So there's all these constant movements um, around vaccination. But what we do know, and I, many of you on the call who are case managers and workers and nonprofits, you all know this, we have been constant advocates for making sure that those resources are made available to our community. And now is the time to continue to lift our voices with our elected leaders to ensure that as the conversation, whether it be at the state or at the local, wherever it sits, at the federal, that there be a equity-minded allocation of vaccines so that these communities of color, like Watsonville, that uh, bared the brunt of COVID cases in our county. Um, and it, if you can pick at other communities in California, you'll see the same dynamic and across the nation, that they'd be minded in that allocation, especially because of the essential workforce that we have in many of these communities. So what can you do about it? In the chat, you're going to see um, an email that connects you to the telephone number and email for our Congressman Jim, Jimmy Panetta, our local assembly members, our local senators. We encourage you to take a couple minutes of your day uh, today or tomorrow, sometime this week, and just send a simple message asking our local leaders to focus on equity distribution of vaccines. That's all we need you to do. Please keep equity in mind. Um, we all know, and some of us may have uh, you know, awareness that our leaders are very equity-minded just based on their past practices on matters like housing, immigration, but it, we, we just need to be uh, uh, reminded that this is also an area where equity is, uh, needs to be front and center. So that's what you can do about it. You have the power also to ensure that our community is um, thought of in all uh, of the systemic steps in rolling this out. So that's what we ask for you to do. And uh, it is 1.30. Uh, Dory, I just wanted oh, to, I see. Does, does Dory have a couple minutes to uh, share the vaccine supply real quickly? Is she, is she on the line? Can we open it up for her, uh, Lisa or Val? so that she can share just a uh, vaccine update? Are we able yes. to do that? Yes. Okay, as, as Lisa's trying to do that so that these questions about rollout get answered, that link to the santacruzhealth.org that was sent previously in your chat can take you to an uh, information around the current public health vaccine supply. Um, we don't have time today to describe the three-legged stool that our director of health recently shared with us as to how vaccination is being rolled out. But if you go to this page, you will see what uh, you will see the vaccine supplies for Santa Cruz County Public Health. So the vaccines that the public health department receives, you will see how many they've actually received and how many they've distributed today. So if you're interested in getting information around 
um, the, the public health vaccine supply, you can go to that link. And let's see if uh, Dory has been able. Dory is the uh, CEO of Salud para la Gente and has been um, front and center in uh, conversations with the county around um, community clinic uh, vaccination events. And let's see if we can get her on. Is she on just via phone? We can't get her on. You're muted. I have, I have her on the call. You want to go ahead, Dory? Sure, sure. And just super brief, because I know we're at the end of time. Um, I think what's most important as, uh, as we're talking about equity is to understand the context of volume of supply of vaccine. Um, what we learned after the new administration um, took uh, went into place at the federal level was that the contracting that had been done previously for the vaccine um, really was a, a more limited supply than we anticipated. And um, the pharmaceutical companies that had uh, supply had contracted out their capacity across the globe. And so there wasn't the flexibility um, that we hoped for to uh, you know, be able to um, increase volume of vaccine supply. So we are working in a context of um, less supply than we anticipated. And it is coming out um, uh, through various pathways, as Erica referenced, one through large uh, multi-county entities like Sutter, Kaiser, and Dignity um, for their patients, and then also um, through federal pharmacy contracts that are really targeting sort of the elderest living and nursing home populations, and then through public health and clinics like ours. Um, so it, the call to action is, is really important in, um, in helping legislators remember that that flow still has, even though we're working with a limited supply of vaccine, that it does need to be done with an eye for equity to make sure that um, where we're talking about the major flow coming through Kaiser Sutter and Dignity that the commercially insured um, folks like all of us that have employment that offers us insurance that is likely to um, allow us to connect with vaccine supply through them, um, there's a, there is a, a very um, vulnerable population who's been out working this entire time that may not have access to that supply and will rely on public health and on clinics like Salud to be able to get their vaccine. And so um, I don't know if that's enough. I don't want to talk longer. I know we're past time. But, yeah, uh, we appreciate the update. Thank you so much. Um, really appreciate it. So with that, um, I ask you to join me in thanking Dr. Gantes and Dr. Kilpatrick and Dory and my colleague Laura. Um, and all of the staff of our respective agencies who made this event possible. We hope that this was informative. We want to ask you to invite your um, family, community members that you may be working with uh, to join us Wednesday for a community conversation similar to this one that we will be hosting in Spanish and Espanol and translating into English. That event is taking place Wednesday at what time, Laura? Are we starting that way? Six o'clock. Six o'clock. So encourage. Uh, your clients uh, to help us spread the information uh, and we'll be having translation to English, interpretation to English. So that is uh, Spanish speaking, like Eric just said. Thank you so much once again, Dr. Kilpatrick, Dr. Gantes, and have a wonderful rest of the week, everybody. Thank you. That was, that was good, guys, very good. Can you stop recording? That way we can. Uh... Oh, yes, stop recording. Yes, but folks are still on. Let me see here. Okay. Bye, folks.